Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about patellar mobilizations. These are manual techniques where either the clinician, as you see here, or the patient themselves can actually move the patella normally in one of four directions, either superiorly towards the hip, inferiorly towards the foot. In this picture, they're actually moving it medially inward, and then you can also move it laterally outward. Now remember that the knee joint is really a composite of two joints. One is the tibiofemoral joint. This is the articulation between the femur and the tibia. That's normally what we think of when we think of the knee. But there's also the patellofemoral joint. Remember that the patella has to be able to glide effectively over the distal anterior end of the femur. And generally speaking, when the knee is extended, doesn't matter if it's open or closed chain, when the knee extends, the patella moves superiorly, and when the knee bends or when it flexes, the patella will move inferiorly. And those are the two major motions. We'll talk about medial and lateral at the end of this video. Now, for patients with stiff knees, that lack either full knee flexion and or full knee extension, it could be one of them or it could be both of them, you can't just consider that tibiofemoral joint. You can mobilize the tibiofemoral joint all you want, but if the patellofemoral joint is stiff, meaning the patella is hypomobile, then that person may continue to have a, a deficit in knee mobility, either in flexion, extension, or both. So some examples where you might actually see a hypomobile patella would be a total knee arthroplasty. Somebody has a knee replacement. Yes, the tibiofemoral joint's gonna be stiff, but that patellofemoral joint, the patella that is, is gonna be very hypomobile. And at first, if you try moving it, you'll find, especially in the superior inferior direction, it's extremely stiff, doesn't wanna move at all. You might also see that following an ACL or a meniscus repair. A lot of times there's so much edema and swelling around the knee joint, and also the quadriceps kind of lock up, everything's kind of stiff in this area, including that patella. And even sometimes after manipulation under anesthesia, which is a technique that's done surgically, if somebody really has a stiff knee or other joint, they basically put them under and then really just crank on it, basically, to try and mobilize it. But even following that, it is a trauma, the patella can become hypomobile. Okay? So these are examples of conditions where you might want to check patellar mobility. So what does a hypomobile patella look like? Well, to understand this, look at this patella right here. So this is the patella. Up here at the top of the screen is inferior. This is towards the foot. Down here is superior towards the hip. So you're basically looking down at your own knee. Imagine you're laying in your bed or you're sitting in a chair looking down at your own knee. Now, the patella will normally have a normal range that it will move in. It can move to this dotted line in the inferior direction and it ought to be able to move to this dotted line in the superior direction. So if the patella is hypomobile in the inferior direction, you start moving it, kind of testing it, and this is kind of what you would see. You can move it back and forth, back and forth in the vertical direction, and it doesn't go very far. That's in the inferior direction. Also, you can have hypomobility in the superior direction, and it's the same kind of thing. It doesn't really want to move. It doesn't move in a normal range. And generally speaking, if it is hypomobile in the inferior direction, it will probably also be hypomobile in the superior direction. The vast majority of cases, it's hypomobile in both. Now, just for reference, a hypermobile patella is going to move much further than it ought to, normally in both inferior and superior directions, like you see here. Now, if you have a hypermobile patella, mobilizations are not necessary, obviously, because the patella already has enough mobility, it actually has too much mobility. So there's another strategy you take there to try and stabilize it. So mobilizations become important when you have patellar hypomobility. Now for the patient position, it doesn't matter if we're checking mobility in general or we're actually doing a mobilization. 
The person's going to be in supine or sitting, it doesn't really matter. And the knee needs to be passively extended or near full extension. By passive, we basically just mean the knee's at rest. Okay, All the muscles are relaxed, particularly the quads. Remember the quads, quadriceps, attach on the patella. So if the quadriceps are actively contracting or they're not relaxed, they're going to be exerting tension on that patella, and that patella will not move. Okay, It will appear way more hypomobile than it already is. Okay, so quads need to be relaxed. So you do this by just having the patient rest with their knee in full extension or near full extension. I tend to find the mobilizations easier when you're about 10 degrees or 15 degrees short of full extension. And in general, for increasing knee extension, you wanna do superior patellar mobilizations, meaning you're mobilizing uh, toward the hip joint. If you wanna increase knee flexion, you do inferior patellar mobilizations, so moving that patella down toward the foot. So what does this mobilization actually look like? Well, we'll first look at a short animation here, and then I'll show you an actual video of me mobilizing my own knee. So what I would generally say to do, a good technique, would be to first move the patella about as far as it will normally go in whatever direction you're doing. Here, I'm doing an inferior mobilization. And then once I'm at that position, I exert a little bit of overpressure because we're really trying to stretch it. It's not a true stretch, but we are trying to get more mobility. So we don't want to just take the patella to its current status quo. We want to push it a little bit further. So we do a little overpressure and we just hold it there. And you can hold it uh, probably at least 20 seconds. I would say 30 second holds would be sufficient. Um, you're not going to get any more benefit beyond 60 seconds, but 30 is a good number to shoot for. Once I'm there, I can even do some grade 4 mobilization. So not just overpressure, I can even exert some extra pulsatile or oscillatory force, just like you do mobilizations on the shoulder joint or on the ankle joint, right? You're doing grade 4 mobilizations at that end range, at that overpressure really trying to get some extra motion in there. The first mobilization we'll look at is an inferior patellar mobilization. So this is where we're gonna move the patella downward towards the tibial tuberosity, which is about right here. This is beneficial when the patient is restricted in knee flexion because as we bend the knee, the patella actually moves down, it translates inferiorly. And these do not follow convex concave rules as we've talked about. So when you do this, the knee should be almost fully extended. It can be fully extended, but it has to be pretty darn close, maybe within 10 degrees of full extension. That's where you're going to get the best mobilization of the patella. And the quadriceps better be completely relaxed because as soon as the quads contract, that patella is not moving anywhere. It's pretty much locked in place due to the tension placed on that quad tendon by the quadriceps. Now this might seem obvious, but a general rule of thumb is whatever direction you're trying to move the patella in, in this case it's going to be an inferior mobilization, the force is going to come from the opposite side of the patella. So if I'm moving it inferiorly, the force is going to be exerted on the superior end down. And wherever you're exerting the force, that's where the skin lock is going to be. So I'm going to take up the skin lock kind of on the superior part of that patella right here. And then I can move it inferiorly like that. See the patella moving. I can even take these fingers and put them on the bottom here. And they're not really so much providing a force. They're just allowing me to detect movement of the patella. The force is still coming from my thumbs right here. So I maintain that skin lock and now I can move it down like that. So there's an inferior mobilization. One way to think about these mobilizations is they're kind of like stretches. So when I move this inferiorly, I want to hold it for maybe at least 20 seconds. I would actually shoot for 30. And so I'm holding it in this inferior position. And from there, I can even do some graded mobilizations. Let's say grade four. So I'm all the way at the end of tissue resistance, right? It's not going much further. So I can just do some quick grade four mobilizations in that inferior direction, okay? 
but when you do this mobilization, you wanna make sure you hold it, not just for two or three seconds, you gotta hold it for a little bit of time, probably at least 20. I would probably shoot for 30 and even throw in some mobilizations there. Now for the superior mobilization, everything is the opposite. The patella is now moving this direction. So if I'm moving it up, that means the skin lock better come from the inferior side of the patella, okay? So you can take up that skin lock right here. The thumbs in this case are just really providing um, some sensory information for me so I know that the patella is moving, and then I'm just gonna move it up like that. and I can hold it there. Again, we're kind of viewing this more like a stretch, right? So at least 20 or 30 seconds, and I can even provide some graded mobilizations there while I'm maintained in that position. So that was superior and inferior patellar mobilizations. But what about if we need to mobilize in the medial or lateral directions? So generally, when somebody comes out of a procedure like this, like a total knee arthroplasty, they're gonna be limited in all four directions. However, as we said, normally the greatest limitation or the greatest hypomobility will be in the superior and inferior directions. Uh, these hypomobilities generally will persist longer and will be more severe than the hypomobilities in the medial and lateral directions. But these can still be present after they come out of a procedure like this. So if you wanna mobilize in the medial and lateral directions, you're gonna do it exactly the same way. So you're going to look at whatever direction you're trying to mobilize, and you would exert the skin lock and the force on the opposite side of the patella. So let's take a look at a video right now. Now this for reference is my left leg. So this would actually be over here, the lateral side of the patella. Over here's the medial side. And the way we mobilize in medial and lateral directions is the same as we did before. The skin lock and therefore the force are gonna be on the opposite side as the direction we're mobilizing towards. So if I wanna do a medial mobilization, then that skin lock and the force is gonna come from the lateral side, okay? So I'm gonna take up that skin lock right there. And sometimes with medial and lateral, when you take up the skin lock, you may even get some movement already. Movement in this direction, medial lateral, is actually pretty easy to get. It's usually a little stiffer in the superior inferior direction. But I'll take up that skin lock there. Again, over here, these fingers are more just providing me sensory information. And I'm just going to translate it. Look at that. You should be able to see that movement. As I was saying earlier, movement or translation in the medial lateral direction is usually quite a bit more significant than it is for superior and inferior. And generally, if somebody has limitations, it's going to be in superior inferior. Normally, the more significant limitations are going to be in the superior inferior direction. Sometimes right after a surgical procedure, there may be some limitations in the medial lateral direction, but those usually uh, reduce pretty quickly. So you usually get mobility in this direction pretty quickly after the procedure. The one that tends to be limited is more superior inferior. But you can see here, I'm just holding that there about 30 seconds, right? 20 to 30 seconds. I can even provide those graded mobilizations, right? So that's the medial direction. Lateral, you could probably guess that. I'm now gonna exert my skin lock and force from the medial side. I'm gonna be pushing out that way. Again, these fingers right here are just sensory information for me. So pull up that skin lock and then just move this laterally like that. And I can hold it there. 20 to 30 seconds, even give some of those mobilizations like that. One other thing you can assess is rotation of the patella. So this is less common to look at, but you can still do it. So again, I'm gonna take up appropriate skin locks like this, really grab the patella like this. So kind of grab it between my first and second digit right there and the same thing on the other side. And I can assess rotation like this. And I can also assess it in the other direction. 
When you do that rotation though, you need to make sure you've taken up those skin locks so you're not just moving skin over the patella. Now, as we mentioned before, superior patellar translation occurs during knee extension, inferior patellar translation occurs during knee flexion, but what about medial and lateral translation of the patella? Well, it turns out if we look at terminal knee extension, so probably the last 15 or 10 degrees of knee extension, we're also going to see some tibial external rotation. Now, this is contingent on this being in the open chain, an open chain knee extension. Uh, if you want to learn more about open versus closed chain, go back and watch the video on the screw home mechanism of the knee. But if we have tibial external rotation, anytime we have this, the patella is actually going to follow the tibia. Okay? So when the tibia rotates externally relative to the femur, the tibia is pointing out more laterally. And so therefore, because the patella via the patellar ligament attaches on the tibial tuberosity, the patella also will translate laterally. So the patella follows the tibia. Anytime we have tibial internal rotation, again, the patella will follow the tibia. So with tibial internal rotation, the tibial tuberosity would be pointed more inward or immediately. And so because the patella attaches on that tuberosity via the patellar ligament, the patella also is going to translate medially. So anytime you have tibial external rotation, the patella is going to tend to translate laterally. Anytime you have tibial internal rotation, the patella is going to tend to translate medially. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of patellar mobilizations, when you would use them, and how to perform them. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.